Hello, everyone. I think we'll get started. Um, we do still have some people joining, but it looks like it slowed down a bit in the last couple of minutes. Um, we have a lot to cover today, so I want to uh, get started. Just a quick introduction. I'm Kay Mosher McDivitt. I am one of the technical assistance specialists with the National Alliance to End Homelessness. And today we're going to talk about this joint component, transitional housing, rapid rehousing joint component, we put on the slide, am I doing it right? Because we know that a lot of folks um, don't have a vast understanding of it or are trying to just get started. So we're doing this webinar to really hone in and have some amazing panelists with us today that will help share in the discussion. So just a little bit um, about the National Alliance and Homelessness. We have, we have three um, divisions. We have a policy division, we have a research division, and then we have a Center for Capacity Building. The webinar today is being sponsored by our Center for Capacity Building, and all three of our divisions work together. And we, if, if you're not familiar with us, maybe this is your first time, we are a, a nonpartisan nonprofit. We're based out of D.C., but we provide um, resources, research, policy, and capacity building across the entire country. And so just a little bit on state statements of participation. We really value that all of you are here. Uh, we also really want to make sure that everyone finds this a safe space to join us in this virtual setting of the webinars. So we're just um, asking, uh, and you'll see these values listed here, but we, we have a zero tolerance policy for any type of um, negative um, statements or making people feel uncomfortable. And if that happens, one of our staff may reach out to you via chat and ask you to discontinue um, the narrative that you may have started in, or if someone makes you feel that way, let us know and we will manage it. We want to make sure that we have a diverse, safe, accepting environment where we can all share and talk openly as we work together to end homelessness. Super important. And just some logistics. So, um, Two boxes. One is chat. You all can be chatting to each other. We encourage you to introduce yourselves in chat, where you're from. You know, maybe if you're if you're doing a TH Rapid Rehousing project, just say, hey, this is what I'm doing here. So we have an understanding of who's on the on the webinar today. But then there's a QA box. We will be taking questions only from the QA box. So make sure that you put your questions in that QA box, and then we will be getting those to our moderator and our speakers to talk about. Um, we do have, um, first of all, I'm going to go to the last one. The webinar is being recorded. And so you will have access to the recording after um, the webinar is over. We will also have the slides available to you. And we will also have an accompanying document, which is like the key takeaways. And towards the end of the webinar, we'll be dumping that, listen to me say dumping that, we will be placing that, um, that um, link in, in chat towards the end of the webinar. So keep an eye in chat. And so you all know um, if you've been doing this or if you haven't, we started this back in January. And one of the things as we have been doing our work at the Alliance and across the country is that our message has always been is that a system, a strong homeless response system is a system where all the elements and all of the providers and all of the interventions are really working together together as a partnership to end homelessness and how all of these different pieces fit together. And so we decided to start this series as part of like, let's go over each of these interventions, but understand that no intervention stands by itself. It's part of the larger whole of ending homelessness in our, our community. And, you know, and having an understanding of how does each part fit and also how do we work together? So we've been, uh, we actually, this is actually our seventh one. So some of those early ones are not on this this slide anymore. Look at me looking like, oh, where did the January, February ones go? But we we started out with outreach. We've talked about prevention. We've talked about problem solving and diversion. Um, we've talked about um, coordinated entry and we had talked about emergency shelter. And our last one we held was in, in um, the month of June. And that one was on rapid rehousing because of our conference in July, we did not hold the session. So here we are and we have still have a few more upcoming ones. So keep an eye on that. And so a little bit about, and I've already talked a little bit about this, but again, why stronger together? So ultimately, this is your goal of an effective homeless response system, no matter what community you're in, no matter how large your, your community is, whether 
for your, you know, your own continuum of care for one, one city or one county, or maybe you're a continuum of care that, that covers a number of counties, or you might be part of a balance of state, which is spread out across the entire state. No matter where you are, there's two main goals to make sure that we can end home homelessness across our country. And first up is that whenever possible, we want to close that front door to homelessness. How do we help people find solutions outside of the homeless system, diverting people through problem solving, making sure that people can get connected to, to their own supports and resources. And then secondly, if that is not an option and people do need to come into our system, everything from the front door should be focused on getting that person housed back into the community as quickly as possible. And also just making sure that in your communities, homelessness is rare, right? So that's that front door, the incidents, uh, first time homelessness, we, we try to really work on how do we address that. And then if it, folks are in the system, we want it to be brief by getting people out quickly into their own housing. And then we want to make sure it's one time, which is where a lot of the follow-up supports come into play. And, and in, in the whole, we've mentioned Housing First throughout this and the Housing First philosophy is that no matter what your background is, no matter what you come with, we believe that we can place you in housing um, and then we're going to put those supports around you. And so again, here's like those four elements is that, you know, people in a crisis have a place to go. People are not uh, unsheltered. People don't spend long times with homelessness and people exit homelessness quickly and don't cycle back into homelessness. And so again, here's your end game. Here And these are the things that, you know, if you're familiar with this, if you're a continuum of care lead, or you're, perhaps you have some continuum of care funding, you may be well aware of these, that these are the, like the four ultimate goals that every community is measured against is how do we reduce that inflow? What do our numbers look like? What are our excess into permanent housing look like? Length of stay and returns to homelessness. See how this fits right to what I just said before in the previous slide. And so then these are all the systems interventions and we're talking today about the joint component of the transitional housing and rapid rehousing. And so I like the slide um, and in fact I put it together so that's why I like it but um, I really want you to think about like and I don't know where you live you all have travel circles but in my community we do and um, and we're also I'm in an area where there's a lot of tourism during certain parts of the year and clearly most of those people are not familiar with traffic circles. And so if a traffic, if people really understand traffic circles um, and, and are just like realizing that it's all about traffic flow, it's about keeping yourself moving, just keeping an eye on what's coming, making sure you're in the right lane and the whole people could come into the system and out of the system quickly and effectively. Um, but if something stops that traffic flow, if that, if a car gets stuck in the middle of that traffic circle or all all of a sudden, a bunch of people approaching the traffic circle get freaked out and they decide, oh, yeah, no, I'm not going to I'm not going to do the way the best practice of what should happen. And they just sort of stop their car and sit there. And then the lines of traffic line up behind them. What happens? Right. The whole flow gets stuck. And now we have a, a lot of people waiting to get into a system and we have a, not a lot of people exiting or if somebody's going too fast. Then they would create other issues. So think of your system as a coordinated, effective, efficient traffic flow. And finally, on this last slide, if you make your investments, if you're just adding programs because it's an eligible HUD program. And, and I want to say that this, you know, this webinar is very timely right now because the NOFO just came out in communities. Um, a joint, the joint component is one of those, um, one of the eligible projects for um, new projects to come in. But what we find is a lot of times there's not a lot of thought. It's like, oh, well, we can get this much money and this is something, so let's just do this without really looking at, does this work? Why would we choose this intervention? Is this exactly what we need? And we're gonna say to you and in and, and upcoming things, and we also just recently had some NOFO information out um, through webinars. So just making sure that folks are really aware locally is that thinking about what you are doing, because if not, it's gonna be a hot mess. You see this, it's like, you got all these things in there, but. You know, there's a big truck in the middle and everything's just sort of piles on top of each other and it's not working effectively. Because if in fact your interventions work together, this is what your system should look like. So, right. All right. So I am now going to turn it over, um, introduce quickly Mary Frances Kenyon. Um, she is a VP of uh, TA and Technical Assistance, that is Technical Assistance and Training for the 
clients, and she will be moderating the session today, and we'll take it from here. So, Mary Frances, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Kay, and thank you to each of you who have joined us uh, this either early or late afternoon, depending on where you're situated in the country. Um, we can actually move right on into the next slide because I'm most excited to introduce our panelists today. Uh, this is very much going to be a learning opportunity for me as well because this is the one area uh, the one program component, component that I've never actually had an opportunity to have deep insights for. Um, so before I talk about the um, objectives of the joint project component, uh, I just want to say this. Uh, as we were preparing for this call, I got to hear from our panelists uh, doing, you know, the preparation. Um, and my takeaways and what I've come to understand is that joint transitional housing and rapid rehousing uh, component projects really offer creativity and innovation. Um, these projects are not intended to replace transitional housing projects that have been reallocated or lost um, funding back when there was a, a shift away from transitional housing to focus more on rapid rehousing, uh, it's really provided a new way to meet some of the pressing challenges that communities are facing. Um, so as you can see, some of the objectives on the screen there are uh, filling in gaps around unsheltered homelessness, uh, survivors of domestic violence, youth and young adults, as well as uh, VA funded homelessness assistance programs. Uh, this is about providing a safe place for people to stay. So that crisis housing element, um, but also, and it's bolded there, at the Alliance, we know what ends homelessness. The research and evidence tells us that quickly housing participants uh, and moving them into that permanent housing uh, is what helps us uh, eliminate homelessness in our communities. So while there are stays in the crisis housing portion of the projects, those stays should be brief and without preconditions. So still grounded in, in housing first. And of course, with any housing intervention, it's so critical to provide financial assistance uh, and those wraparound supports and services. Next slide, please, Kay. So um, now we're going to focus just a little bit on the different components. So as I mentioned, transitional housing side of TH um, is really that interim crisis housing. Uh, the goal, the North Star, is going to be that permanent housing. Um, transitional housing is just able to be used as a bridge to do this. Uh, and I'm not even going to try and botch the different components because we've got some, again, phenomenal speakers uh, that will serve as panelists today that can just be far more eloquent than I can. But um, the... the Components are, are right there for each of you to see, and we can move on to the next slide, which is going to be the nuts and bolts. Um, so the project has to offer both transitional housing and rapid rehousing. These are not standalone programs, um, and it has to be offered to all participants. Um, the shortest length of stay is, is reasonable, but no more than 24 months in total. So this is the transitional housing stay and the rapid rehousing uh, stay as well. A supportive services are a must. They've got to be a part of the entire projects. And we've got to center participant choice. So someone has to opt in to this and not necessarily be forced to um, accept, uh, accept this program. Next slide, Kay. Um, so I talked about this. I'll just uh, kind of gloss over this. But uh, this is a tool that we can use to address unsheltered homelessness. Um, this is a tool for survivors of DV. Um, this can also be a tool for communities that have really high rates of uh, unsheltered youth and young adults experiencing homelessness. Next slide, please. But there are some minimum uh, standards that joint component projects should address. So uh, it should be targeted and still be prioritizing those with the higher needs who are most vulnerable. So think about not just vulnerability, but acuity. Um, what do they need to stabilize immediately and then transition into permanent housing? Um, using housing first, uh, this is not, you know, as a joint component project, this is not a departure from housing first. Okay, I think we lost some of the slides there. Oh. Um, this is still centered very much as a housing first uh, approach. So centering a client's strengths, um, centering their 
choice centering their needs, um, but also focusing on helping them move to permanent housing as quickly as possible and doing so without those barriers and preconditions. So low barriers to entry, um, making sure that we are looking at the whole of the household from the people to the pets to the possessions um, and any other needs that they might have. Really partnering alongside um, the, the participants who are opting into the, the program and to the joint component, um, making sure that you all are doing that planning uh, to support them finding permanent housing. And that's based on the individual and unique needs of that individual. Last but not least, um, making sure that folks are connected to resources. And this is true of any housing intervention, whether it be crisis housing or permanent housing. It's really critical to ensure that folks are able to achieve their goals and that they're connected to the community in which they live with the appropriate resources and supports to help them stay there. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to move us in to the bread and butter of today, which is going to be our conversation amongst panelists. I am going to be today's moderator. Um, I'll just do a brief introduction of our speakers and uh, they can wave or say hello and we'll dive right into some guided questions that I have. Uh, we will also be keeping uh, a, an eye on the Q&A and we'll try to get to as many of the questions that are related to this topic today as possible. Um, and sometimes we do not um, don't necessarily get to all of them, but we will follow up uh, if you drop your email. All right, so first up, we have with us today, Nicole Williams. Uh, Nicole is with the YWCA of Greater Cincinnati. Welcome, Nicole. Okay, um, next up, we have Jackie Jasanti of Valley Youth House. Welcome, Jackie. Uh, then we've got Lee Howard, fellow TA provider in the building. Lee is with Diana T. Myers and Associates, and we'll be bringing that consultant and technical assistance lens. Um, and then we have Katie Elder. Katie's going to go off camera in just a second, but we're very fortunate today to have Katie, who's um, a research associate at Urban Institute, and we'll be sharing some um, cool new information on a study that they've got coming up. Uh, and last but not least, we have Cindy, uh, Cindy Musavu, uh, who's with Housing Families First uh, in Central Virginia. And uh, Cindy, there you go. All right, with that, I am, who's going to get the first question? Dun, dun, dun. I'm kidding, y'all. Um, so I'm actually going to ask Lee to kick us off. Um, Lee, if you we, we want to explore some of the best practices and um, Kay, we can go ahead and pull the slides down if we haven't already. But for communities that are on the line today that have heard about joint THRRH as a program component are kind of on the fence and unsure, let's talk about getting started in best practices. Lee, how is it that you message to a community and to stakeholders in community um, what joint transitional housing, rapid rehousing is, and, and why is messaging even important? Yeah, thanks for the question and good afternoon, everybody. Um, so uh, a lot of my work is, uh, we work with uh, in about a dozen or so uh, COCs across the country, uh, but most of my time is spent um, in Pennsylvania and Eastern and Western uh, balance of state COCs. We have two uh, where we work under contract with the collaborative applicant, uh, the Pennsylvania uh, Department of Community and Economic Development um, to help support a lot of the work of the COC, uh, including to help facilitate the funding process. And so a number of months ago, we released our annual uh, gaps analysis and then offered a notice of intent process that was coupled with um, technical assistance opportunity. So for the last three months, I've been meeting with um, literally dozens of folks um, in these COCs who have new project ideas. And one of the my internal uh, dialogue around uh, a call that's focused on THRRH uh, is wisdom for my father, which is just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, the T the joint component can be a great model. Uh, it makes a lot of sense, but it really depends on the community, the needs in the community, the intention or plan of the provider, um, and a number of other variables. And so when approaching that conversation, 
I think it's really important, um, at least for me, to hear what is the problem that you're trying to solve, that this is the right component for you, as opposed to a rapid rehousing project, for example. Um, and a lot of the a lot of the folks, uh, you know, that that I have been talking to have certainly mentioned things that you also had on the slide, like we don't we have a, an unsheltered population and inadequate shelter capacity or um, we have one shelter in our community and they're very high barrier. We really need to offer an alternate solution so that we can get folks into uh, a safe um, uh, situation and then work on a, a rehousing plan. Um, so those are all, you know, I think parts of the conversation. In terms of messaging, one of the things I try to make sure folks understand is that while the um, transitional housing programs of yesterday had value um, and really worked to uh, prioritize things like um, self-sufficiency, that's not the goal of the COC. And so with, with the framework of our goal is to uh, end homelessness for folks, uh, to uh, reduce homelessness across the community, uh, improve system performance measures, et cetera, um, how do you use this model appropriately and accordingly, um, uh, blending that with, with client choice? Um, and so really prioritizing that the projects have enough uh, rapid rehousing resources attached, that the supportive services are adequate, not just to provide case management support, but also to really um, provide really robust housing search assistance um, as part of the model. Um, so that's that's the the focus of a lot of the conversation, but I'm sure others have have something to add to that as well. Yeah, and I appreciate your technical uh, lens, Lee. I'd like to invite Jackie in to to weigh in around the messaging. Jackie, what are your thoughts about how you message it from like the direct service lens, uh, and why is that important? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Yes, we operate um, a THRH for transition age youth, um, 18, 20, 18 to 24 year olds. Um, I think the biggest message, and I know we'll get into this later too, is how we message it in the beginning versus how we message it now, right? Um, and I think, Lee, you touched upon this. It's this short term um short-term solution for them and meeting their basic needs, providing them with the safety that they're looking for, but also um, I like to use words, not making them comfortable, right? And how do we move them along to the next um, component of this program, which is rapid rehousing with the ultimate goal of housing stability. Thank you for that, Jackie. Um, I want to pivot now to as we're thinking about like how to get started, you've got some great tips around messaging and the conversations that need to be had um, with that great quote that is now memorialized in our chat from Lee. Um, Nicole, I want to ask you, because I, I mentioned earlier as I was giving a, you know, an overview and summary of the joint component. Um, centering client choice and making sure that client choice is a part of both components, right? Can you talk a little bit about how you optimize client choice, um, especially given what Jackie just said about like making sure that folks don't get too attached to the transitional housing side so that they can move on to rapid rehousing? So yes, those conversations start very early from day one. Um, really setting the stage of expectation, not only from the people that we're serving, but the expectation of the staff that's working with them. So in my seat, we look to help maintain those caseloads so that they are workable, so that they are hearing the stories of the people that they are working with and getting to know what those barriers look like so that we can address those barriers in a timely fashion um, but also realizing that um, each individual person that we work with um, have their own special needs that need to be taken care of. So um, putting the client needs first and eliminating <clears throat> or decreasing those barriers um, as quickly as we can. Um, so working with that person individually to address the things that they want to address, as well as encompassing the things that will carry them to the next phase of their housing um, opportunities. 
Thank you, Nicole. Um, Cindy, is there anything you want to add about client choice? Yes, I think that, you know, here in Richmond, we we knew that we were only going to have a certain number of transitional units to begin with. And so wanting to think bigger about client choice and sort of like, what are all the choices even beyond the units that we may have? And so we had to sort of craft um, a, a pretty much like a needs assessment tool that we could use pretty much like Nicole said from day one to level set expectations on sort of what's available, but also what are your needs. And so we sort of teased out this document where when we are receiving um, a match or a referral that we can then position with our youth to say, talk to me about what you need. Are you looking for a crisis, uh, emergency crisis bed? Are you looking for services or something, you know, in between and helping to understand that even our, our transitional units have a component because it's off property, it's at another um, apartment location under a master lease, like there's a little bit of a background screen that's required for those apartments. And so then making sure youth know that if they do want to go to those crisis beds, there's that bit that they have to be okay with. Or if they don't want to submit to um, that background, then they could maybe go to a different emergency interim bed location. And so I found that in creating this tool, we were able to sort of provide all that information in a really sort of conversational, approachable way, but then sort of help the youth to make the selection that best fit their needs. Um, and so we call that the crisis response and youth housing program access tool. It's a big word, but um, I find that then we're also offering the joint component up front. And that way, if our units are full in the transitional side, there are other emergency beds that we could be utilizing and, and still be offering the rapid rehousing throughout if that is what the youth desire. And then we're leveraging other beds. And so then we're increasing the flow and the capacity of like K's flow of the traffic circle. Um, we have youth that we're serving in our joint project that are in emergency beds in our, our other emergency shelter or they're in a motel stay with a DV situation or you know they're, they're in different places. So we're going to where the youth are, where they said they need to be but then we're also utilizing rapid rehousing as that bridge. And so I found that that having that needs assessment up front was ideal for us in order to make sure we're offering those nuts and bolts like that slide you showed. So love this. And I actually am going to call on you, Cindy, and you, Nicole, once again. So I want to take a, a live question from the Q&A. Um, this is a, a question from Meredith, who is talking about a youth serving project. Um, and her question is interesting. She says she understands the rationale for transitional housing as an emergency and then moving to more permanent rapid rehousing. But do you ever see clients that move down from rapid rehousing to transitional housing? Um, they have some clients that are opting to go directly into rapid rehousing and then having some trouble maintaining that housing. What are your thoughts? Cindy, I'll go to you first and then you can kick it over to Nicole. Okay, so I have of, we're still a new project, so we just started receiving clients in December. Um, and so a couple of things that I, you know, that we set out to do with the joint component in terms of going from rapid to transitional, um, we knew up front that we wanted to be strategic about that, that pivot for a family. And like, yes, we know it's an option and we know it's available, but um, we had made a conscious choice not to sort of lead out with that necessarily because those crisis beds are so critical. Um, that we knew that we wanted to use them in a sort of strategic way. Um, and I'll give an example one such way. We did. We were full in those units and we had another youth who had did not want to go to other emergency crisis beds in our system. Um, she was, um, you know, about to deliver her baby um, far enough along and she had been in her vehicle and at some point came forward and said, you know, she's in our youth rapid component, but also then presented with, I do now need to be in crisis beds, right? Because I'm delivering my baby tomorrow, right? And so um, that was her choice. She waited, she wanted to wait. She waited until she couldn't wait anymore. And so then we had to sort of figure out, okay, how do we get her in from a rapid? She was unhoused, but how do we now get her into an interim crisis bed very quickly? And so having that component, having the option of saying like, what's available, let's plug something in somewhere and we were able to move her into emergency beds very quickly in our system of care and then she was housed actually she had gotten approved so we housed her um, after the baby came um, but in that sense it's like having that option of saying she can't she's eligible for those interim beds let's figure out how to get her in 
um, was a resource, was a strategy, and it was a tool in real time that we found was helpful. Um, and I, I see us making use of that transition um, from rapid to, to transitional more in that light. Um, but for those who are housed in rapid rehousing, um, to pivot into transitional housing, um, we again, we have not had to we don't have a precedent in this framework to, to lean on, but our other programs, the precedent we have for that is if the unit becomes uninhabitable for some reason and there's a fire or there's a situation where we've got to pull out for a second or maybe the, the contract, the landlord agreement is um, rapidly dissolving and there's a mutuality to ending that relationship. But now we need to pivot because this family is going to be experiencing literal homelessness, um, unsheltered homelessness. And so then we need to figure out is there a movement into the transitional component or is there a movement where there's another emergency interim crisis bed in our system of care that can support them while we find the next spot if there's like a, a crisis of that way. So that's how we see us utilizing that pivot, although maybe in time we will have to think more um, strategic um, in sort of the levels of crisis that we want to navigate that as a tool. But I don't, Nicole, I'll pass yeah. the ball to you. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen us have to use that pivot from rapid rehousing to transitional housing. We want to keep people moving ac across that continuum. So what I have seen is that we can add in different layers of supportive services. We can collaborate with other partners within the community, um, utilize our COC resources. Um, I am from a domestic violence um program and agency. So we uh, partner with ODVN on um, those, those barriers that would address some of the things that we see um, that challenge our, our participants to stay housed. Um, so I, I, I don't think our, we would utilize the choice of going from rapid rehousing um, to tradition, uh, transitional housing. We would implement more supportive services, as long as the client is um, willing to participate in that. Um, we would let them kind of guide the bus um, in their services and addressing the barriers that they're experiencing. So what I, I hear from you is more of the progressive engagement, meeting people where they are, um, starting with you know the least amount of support uh, and, you know, progressively increasing that support in the event that, uh, for whatever reason, they're not finding success in, in maintaining uh, maintaining their housing stability. Awesome. Can, so, can I just oh, add one more thing to that? You know, mm -hmm. no one's life is linear. Um, so we shouldn't expect our participants' life to be linear. You know, many times people take two steps forward and three steps back. Um, and, and that's just the way life is. And so, you know, like you said, we may have to pile on some supports at one at any given time, not just at the beginning, but it could be months down the line, something happens, something occurs, something triggers them. Um, so we have to be cognizant of that life is not linear. We may take some, some curves, some turns, um, but, you know, we have those, um, those supports that we can put in place to help on that continuum of, of services. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm actually going to pull in uh, lead to this next question that is uh, sort of a hodgepodge of some questions that I see coming in through Q&A. Um, and there seems to be some um, folks that are asking for clarity around rap the rapid rehousing side of the component. Um, rapid rehousing is considered permanent housing. A participant has chosen a place to live and they have a lease in their own name. Um, there's a subsidy that comes with rapid rehousing. However, through the use of progressive engagement, um, ultimately the goal is to wind that subsidy down. Um, and hopefully participants have increased their income or they've been connected to a deeper long-term subsidy like a voucher, uh, but rapid rehousing is considered permanent in nature um, because someone is in a home of their own while they might be getting supportive services and a rental subsidy that doesn't change the fact that the housing is permanent. Lee, do you wanna weigh in on that at all? Um, Lee or Jackie? 
I mean, I think you just covered it. I mean, I think that the the oh no, was which was great. Uh, plus, um, uh, rapid rehousing. You know, the component uh, HUD does refer to that as like PH dash RRH. Uh, because as Mary Francis just mentioned, the lease is in the client's name. Um, while the subsidy may be short term, uh, the, uh, the the model is considered to connect folks to permanent housing. Um, I don't know that I could add much more to that, but certainly um, we'll kick it over to Jackie in case she wants to add something. Um, yeah, no, I, I mean, that's all very true, um, you know, especially with the youth, um, you know, we'll go back to that kind of that short term um, versus, you know, long term, you know, we want them to be able to have this sense of security in their own apartment. Um, so getting them into rapid rehousing, and even if we have to stick with them for longer, right, we aim to provide six months of rental assistance, but sometimes for the youth population, it's much longer than that. Um, and that allows us to work with them, you know, longer, connect them to those services, connect them to the resources that they need to be successful and maintain this apartment on their own. So another good question, um, and I will, I'm not actually going to call on a specific person. Um, my next question, I'm seeing this theme come up in the chat and the Q&A as well, um, but how do you ensure you're using the new project of joint TH and RRH and not the traditional transitional housing? Um, someone in the chat, Danielle, is saying they've got a transitional housing program for youth, but it's very high barrier. Um, she's asking, you know, about best practice and moving to low barrier. Can we talk through that a little bit? I'm just going to jump in real quick, and hopefully folks who are doing the work can can chime in as well. But I think this is part of the, the work that happens before the application even goes in, um, is, is really having a very clear vision of what your system wants from this kind of project, what your system needs, what the clients and the community need, um, and, and molding that, you know, this is a more flexible model in ways that some of the other models like uh, rapid rehousing and permanent supportive housing cannot be. Um, but part of that is really being clear with, with the provider um, that this, this is not a transitional housing or rapid rehousing that's going to be able to solve every problem uh, that exists in your community, but being really clear about what is the problem that we want to solve and what are the sort of limitations that we want to put in place. So part of that is your community really considering in advance what needs to be in your written standards to help support this? What kind of language do you want to include in a RFP so that folks uh, are clear that if they are applying for this, um, what the limitations and barriers are, including questions that help to ensure that folks do understand those limitations or that structure that you're putting in place and that they're prepared to be able to operate the project in a way that is aligned to that structure. Um, th these are all kinds of sort of things that I would, I, I, I would certainly suggest that folks do. Um, another wisdom from my father, garbage in, garbage out. You know, not to say that any of the projects are garbage, but the point is that if you don't have the right structure in place on the front end, it's going to be really hard to work with that provider to say, hey, remember how we told you you could do literally in everything you wanted with this project? You can't anymore. We want you to, you know, really rein it in and have these parameters in place. That's a really hard conversation that I don't ever like to have. Um, and so if you can do the work on the front end to really help to mold and shape the project to be responsive to the needs in the, your community, that to design it in a way that's going to um, be targeting folks who are literally homeless uh, and, and expedite uh, the rapid rehousing portion of it. Again, while honoring client choice, um, that's certainly something that, that that time will be well spent uh, throughout the, the next several steps and through the implementation of the project. Sorry, thank you, Lee. Thoughts of others? Um, I'll just piggyback off that because I, I, we, Housing Families First, we were a transitional, uh, you know, a shelter back in the early 2000s. And we did make that big conversion to emergency shelter for families in 2012, 2013. And then we converted into sort of that low barrier model, thanks to Kay and all their work doing that. 
And so I think that for us, having that as a background going into this project helped us to level set expectations on how do we bring the urgency of ending homelessness to this conversation? How do we bring that low barrier flavor to the policy and procedures and implementation documents? Um, how much of this is uh, similar to our sort of emergency shelter to rapid rehousing structure and where are the adaptations that we can make for our youth to benefit those um, youth centric services um, while keeping the the main thing, the main thing. And so we wanna end the crisis. Um, we wanna do so quickly, we wanna help, help navigate all the various options that youth can have in terms of what they can access in the community for their own housing. We wanna keep all the lanes open for all the different options, whether that's bear market or something that's um, subsidized or something other creative option over here and sort of figuring out all the doors are open until they start to close based on circumstance, based on choice, based on what's available and, and how safe it is. And so we just took those fundamentals and we were like, okay, let's put that into this. And it can be, you know, sort of that 2.0 lens on how we want to utilize that joint um, element. And honestly, it's, it is the the rapid rehousing joint uh, and transitional, like the, the two could together, um, you know, for us kind of mirrors what happened in the early days. There was enough rapid that you could have every family that came to shelter utilize rapid rehousing as a as a as a as a bridge to get moving along. And then that that became really, um, you know, um, there were just the capacity for that was um, had shifted. And so with them, prioritization came in. And so with this, it's it's just another robust way for the youth to receive the services that they need, but keeping in mind um, the fundamentals um, really helped us shift that that narrative from sort of that old transitional model to the new. Um, and that's what our community needed. So to your point, Lee, it was sort of working with the COC on, you know, how does this need to function um, and what are the needs? Yeah. And in that vein, I want us to pivot the conversation. Thank you. Uh, thank you to each of you for talking about getting started and getting into the best practices. Um, but we know all of our program interventions have challenges and they have successes. So um, let's start out with, uh, let's go back to Nicole um, for just a second here. Uh, my question to you is like, when you initially started working with the joint THRRH component, um, what were some of your initial challenges and what are some of your ongoing challenges? So I wasn't with our agency at the beginning, but um, just knowing about the, the project and how um, things got ramped up and lessons learned after the fact, um, I would say, you know, really the awareness and education of what the, the program is and how participants can move through the program um, so that you don't have individuals um, getting stuck or, and or comfortable in the just the TH part of the joint component, um, really assessing each head of household, um, what their needs and barriers are, and, you know, having access to those wraparound services and knowing who those providers and players are and having them all at the table um, with easy ways of getting the referral and getting access to those. Um, it doesn't do anybody any good to identify the barriers, but you have to wait for a waiting list, a long waiting list to access those services. Um, so, you know, having those partners in place and ready to work with your agency and your participants um, when you need them to be there at the table. Um, we work inside of a continuum of care as well. So we have a lot of partner agencies that are um, into this work to end homelessness, um, to empower our families to move from, from homelessness into being sheltered in their own homes. So um, we have people that sit around the table with the same common goal. Um, so that always helps as well. Um, I would also say that, you know, you know, probably looking back at how things were, making sure, like Lee said, those standards are in place, those best practices are in place, and not being timid to having those conversations with the people that we're working with, because we want them to maximize their opportunities 
in this program as well. And so setting them up for success means that we have to have those conversations. So um, I would say that part. Cindy, Jackie, you want to weigh in? Jackie? Yeah, I can chime in on that one. Um, so I've been running the THRRH um, from the get-go in 2018. Um, so uh, the first house that we opened was a master leased property with um, for young men. So we targeted that population because at that point in time, we had um, mostly single um, young men on the waiting list. Um, and in basic terms, uh, we, you know, we had little guidance. We didn't really set a lot of parameters, rules. We didn't really know what we were doing and essentially was like running a frat house in the beginning. Um, and we really had to hone in on what the goal of this program really was, because unfortunately, these young adults thought that we were just going to, they were just going to stay forever, right? They were in high school. Um, you know, they thought they could finish out their high school career here. They could do whatever they wanted to do. Um, and it just wasn't the case. So we really had to like narrow down some of those, like what are our non-negotiable rules in this type of a setting? Um, we do subleases with our clients um, to make sure that you know, they understand the expectations of a lease agreement, which kind of like helps prepare them for rapid rehousing as well. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, non-negotiable rules, you're living with other people. How do we set those parameters? You know, no drugs, no alcohol, no weapons. Those are non-negotiables for this program, um, you know, and really just setting those expectations that they're going to be you know, working on finding an income, employment, you know, moving them along, you know, through the process. So like I said, we can help transition them into rapid rehousing. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, so now that we've talked a little bit about the challenges, um, let's talk a little bit about staff. We know uh, the Alliance has done some recent work. We did a large workforce study and found out a lot of information. We know that our, there's a, a lot of turnover for some various reasons in our field. Um, how are you all navigating the high turnover um, as it relates to implementing your, your joint THRRH program? And, you know, why is hiring the right people important in general, but specifically for joint THRRH? I'll just jump in. I, you know, I, we're, no one is immune to this discussion. And I really appreciated that the Alliance sent that survey out. We had so many people contribute to that and it, it was very uh, thoughtfully done. And I, I think that one of the things that for implementation that I have always tried to like keep in mind is that we need, uh, we're better in numbers. We're better in our, our strength. Like I, I'm a social worker at heart and strengths-based perspective on staffing is, is definitely the way to go for me. And I try to utilize like, what are the universal things that everyone can do to sort of help keep staff in a position to be fluid so that clients and services don't get held up if someone's on vacation or on leave or has to take a break or whatever the situation is, we're all dealing with and uh, juggling our personal lives and things are coming up and uh, the, just the general state of, of the world. And I think that just having that understanding and making sure, you know, um, we just have sort of structured like everyone in, uh, serving on all of our programs are uh, certified housing counselors who can also inspect units and talk to landlords and follow up a cold call and go in and do a lease signing, cut checks, uh, well, they're not cut checks, but, you know, put in the request and navigate uh, arrears, do negotiations. I mean, everyone has that skill set across the board, whether you are, um, you know, a family housing case manager or you are a housing navigator, um, a director of some level. And I think that that has been a game changer because when there is turnover or we want to pivot someone's skill set is, you know, they are crushing it with landlord engagement. And, and, and they do really well with the client piece, but maybe we just need to highlight that resource and those auxiliary gifts so that we can steward them appropriately and like retain people in their spheres of excellence, right? So I just, I know that that's a little more like uh, abstract in a way, it's not as much like, you know, but crafting your roles, making them fluid, 
having uh, the, the right of first refusal for staff. So if someone does leave because they want to go back to school and so you want to offer like, hey, there's this opening, does this does this uh, program over here strike strike a tone with anyone that wants to sort of continue to go in this direction? And, you know, I think doing that cross training, having those collaborative trainings across your programs have helped. And so that way folks do know what shelter uh, work you know, if you've done shelter work, you know what it is. And so then you know that that's the lens you want someone to sort of have when trying to hire for the joint project, because they're going to be familiar with low barrier emergency crisis beds, ending your crisis, setting the timelines, the milestones that families need to hit in order to sort of stay in a relative path to ending their crisis within a 45 day period. I mean, this is what we've been tasked with, with these grants that we're operating. So I just think that that's a real critical component is is offering that really having a strong team structure and having that cross collaboration among the roles and finding those universal strengths and gifts that everyone can have and be trained on and have excellence in so that you can port and um, staff whenever it's needed and they can support each other when they need coverage. Thank you for that. Now that we, so I'm just trying to make sure we get to cover all the different things. So I'm going to pivot us to talk about fun stuff. Let's talk about some of the successes y'all have seen. Who wants to go first? So y'all don't want to talk about the fun stuff? I'll go. <laughs> there we go. Just because I have um, a youth that, um, tugged at my heartstrings a little bit this week, but um, we've had a, a young man in our transitional housing program um, for quite a few months now. He's probably been there about six or seven months. Um, and he hit, he hit a roadblock, just feeling very, um, very defeated, very, I'm never going to get my own apartment. I'm never going to be able to do this. Um, you know, just thinking, I'm just going to right. I'm going to go back and live in my car, right? That's just going to be the easiest thing for me to do right now. Like, why am I, you know, you put these applications in for apartments, right? He keeps getting denied. He's got all the barriers, right? The low credit, the lack of income, the not a great work history, all these things. Um, so uh, we had a case manager that was out on vacation at a real crucial time. Um, he had applied for an apartment. We had to wait for the case manager to come back. It's a whole big thing. But anyway, this kid really pushed through and was persistent. Case manager came back, followed up with the landlord. And out of, I don't even know, there must have been 30 applicants. It was a very popular property. They approved him. And he just found out on Monday. And he was like, just like, you know, hugging everybody. everybody you know, like everybody did such a wonderful job for him. He was so thankful that the program did what he needed to do. And he should be moving. He should be getting his keys uh, maybe tomorrow, Monday, sometime soon. So he's very excited. So for a kid that was ready to really like give up on like, I'm never going to be able to do this. We know that he's going to be able to do it. And he was persistent and he pushed through. I love that. That just pulled up my heartstrings. I know. Any, any other successes y'all want to talk about? Well, I'll just say like our team has a multitude of successes. Um, being an agency or a program that works with domestic violence survivors, um, just the fact that they're, they've left the uh, abusive situation and not knowing what's coming next um, in their life, that is a success in itself. Um, all the way to individuals signing their first lease ever, um, uh, there are so many different participants we work with who has never worked with a work workforce development coordinator before um, and really trying to tra change the lens of just getting a job versus beginning a career. Um, and so um, there's so many different successes that we have in our, in our program um, that we see on a regular basis, even from individuals who don't engage or have very little engagement to picking up the pace on engagement, um, reunification of, of children with their, with their household and their parents. Um, so there's a multitude of successes that we see, um, which keeps us doing the work and being compassionate about the work that we do 
um, especially on those very uh, hard days or those very heavy days um, where we have lots of barriers to address um, on a rotating basis. So um, I would also say that, you know, we have uh, a great team like spirit and environment where um, a household can be on your caseload. But if you are having um, a barrier yourself at addressing something, you can always reach out and your partner colleague will help. Um, all the way up to myself, I, I roll up my sleeves and do what I can as well. So we have that, you know, that kind of atmosphere. Um, we celebrate each other, especially in those challenging moments um, to get us through. Um, and we celebrate together. So, I mean, um, you have to have that camaraderie with each other. Um, and sometimes turnover makes that environment a little challenging to keep. Um, but the ones that stay welcome the ones that come on um, with open arms. And it's not a top-down training kind of thing. It's an encompassed um, uh, training across the board, peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, management to, peer, you know, to colleagues. So um, we just try to keep a warm, welcoming environment um, and support each other along the way. Um, I love that. I want to pause us for just a second. Lee, this one's for you. We have a number of questions in the Q&A. How does Joint CH, high-level overview, how does it work with coordinated entry? Oh, I think the, the answer may be different for um, for each of our uh, uh, other panelists, Jackie, Nicole, and Cindy. Um, I think, you know, it depends, again, how you structure the project. If you structure it as crisis housing, you know, I used the example at the beginning saying um, a recent conversation with some was with a provider in a community that only has one emergency shelter. That emergency shelter operates with significantly high barriers. Um, and the intention of, of if, if they're selected and funded uh, through this, this current NOFO round, will be to sort of provide an alternate shelter option in that community unofficially, right, because it is transitional housing. Um, but the, the idea will be that um, through coordinated entry that the referral will go to the shelter just like it would, or to the, the TH side, just like it would any other shelter in the community. Um, and then folks, but once they're in the project, you don't have to be referred back out for, for the rapid rehousing side, right? So somebody's in shelter, true shelter, and they do, you know, the assessment and, and they're on your by name list or whatever you call it in your community. Um, uh, there will be a second a separate referral likely for rapid rehousing, depending on the specifics of how your coordinated entry system works. But once folks are in the THRH joint component, um, that separate referral for um, for rapid isn't needed, right? So then the conversation really becomes between the staff person, the case manager, whatever you call that position, and the household to talk about, you know, let's prioritize moving you into permanent housing. Let's come up with a housing plan. Let's do a housing search. Let's do all of those various things. And they get to have that continuity of, of staff unless you've got multiple people, which I, I have to just tell you this approach about, uh, you know, working in teams. Um, it's so obvious, but the way you all describe it, I just I just love it um, and really appreciate the the intentionality that you're bringing to um, uh, how that will benefit not only your team internally, but the work directly with your clients. Um, and so, it, like I said, I think to, to the question about coordinated entry, it may look slightly different in each of their communities, and it might make sense for them to describe it. But, but I think the key difference is that once you're in the project, you then have access to rapid versus then sitting in shelter or uh, in some communities, I know timing out of shelter becomes uh, an issue. Those things are not issues in these projects, uh, which is a real benefit to the folks um, participating. Thank you for that, Lee. Um, just a quick follow up for the other panelists, or actually for Jackie. Jackie, any fair housing issues with targeting men for your program? 
Oh, let me backtrack on that. Okay. So what I meant by that was when uh, we obviously operate off coordinated entry as well. And what we will do is we'll take um, obviously the highest on the list, um, you know, for rapid rehousing. And then obviously we offer the transitional housing component to whoever that individual is. And at that point in time, when we opened our house, there was probably 15 young men at the top of our prioritization list for four beds that we had available. So that's just how that um, ended up because we were trying to figure out who we were going to put in that house. And um, we just happened to have young young men, adults that were at the top of the prioritization list. So um, now we kind of do a mixture of, um, we have two sites now. And at that time we, we did not um, initially um, have both of those. So. Thank so, you for adding that yeah, clarification. Sure. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right, so we are um, moving right along and dun, dun, dun. I wanna talk a little bit now about um, how you know you're doing the work right. What does that mean? Um, what does that look like? And I think we can start out with you, Nicole. Um, so as a, as a director, I look at that on a multitude of sides. So uh, working in our community COC, um, there's lots of data, lots of reports that are ran, um, lots of pulse on the community and its homelessness population. We work closely with the coordinated entry in our COC. Um, so we have that direct pipeline. Um, the, the population that we target is individuals and households that have experienced domestic violence. And so um, how do we know that we're doing it right? Um, anytime we get a, a match that, we, uh, that a person qualifies for clean domestic violence and needs housing and we get that match and that person comes into our program um, and they begin to address the, the barriers of them not having housing, um, the barriers of uh, being a survivor of domestic violence, um, really connecting and restarting their life. Um, we sometimes see not only the physical um, scars, but experience the emotional scars as well, where we get people who are closed off and then we see them open up. We see the wounds heal. So um, in seeing their progress, and sometimes it's, um, very slow at first, um, but seeing that progress in them as a person regain confidence in themselves and learning all the tools to go to that next level. Uh, as a director in the seat, that's kind of like the client facing stuff, um, but as a director in that, um, to know that we are the pillar of the agencies that work with these this population um, and that our expertise in this area is called upon amongst other partners when there are individuals identified in needing this joint component or housing options um, in their life at that time. So it's just kind of a mixture of knowing that you're doing it. And I'm sure my direct staff that's on on the call today to tell you more about, you know, the uh, the steps that the individual participants take along their their journey, um, and you know, just getting their feedback. We do surveys. Um, we have listening sessions. Uh, some some of our units that we uh, master lease. There's lots of people in that in those buildings that are our participants so we can touch base and um, you know more easily with them but we keep in tune with the people that we serve um, and not you know we can't always change things that they they bring up or recommend but we do value their feedback and look at our our processes and our standards and our best practices to see where we can make those changes I know earlier in the conversation, we were talking about, you know, how we train people to do the work that we do. So there's formal training and there's informal training. When I'm looking for someone to come on board 
in this program to do the work is not always the formal things that I look for. We look for a person to have creativity um, in case management because case management looks different than case management that I did 20 years ago. Our population is different. Our circumstances are different. So we look for people who are creative, who can pivot, who can adapt, um, and also resource out um, the things that we can't handle or take care of internally. So I would say, you know, being able to um, carry the basket of all the different things that our uh, participants need and help them along the way um, with their guidance and knowing where they want to go uh, helps us know that we're doing things right. Thanks, Nicole. Cindy, how about you? How are you measuring whether or not y'all are doing this right? So I think just as a as a new project, but still heavily entrenched in our COC, we are still trying to walk with our performance measures that our system has established for rapid housing, for emergency shelter, and trying to pull some of those themes together to sort of say, look, we we know that we want to um, try to end someone's homelessness in a in a given, you know, it used to, before the pandemic, it was like an average of 29 nights. And now we're in, you know, well into the, um, you know, 50s, 60s, and depending on where you live, I know it's different in every community, but, um, you know, just not taking um, they're unhousable or there's no housing as an answer. Like that is not something we're going to speak about because we it's implied in the work that we do that we are housing first and that that's why there's a need for us in this community to serve. Um, and I think that um, from our youth, I know it was mentioned before, but, you know, working on um, elements for collecting, um, you know, input from our youth and making sure we're compensating them for that. Um, working with our COCs, uh, YABs, or working with our lived experience uh, committees and things like that. Um, I know that um, those things are taking shape differently in other communities, but just really being at the table for those conversations so that we can be making sure that that input is being heard and that our documents are being revised. You know, it's a pilot. So we know that we're going to need to go back to the drawing, the drawing board and just being flexible. Um, and I think the, the data for us is, is critical. Um, every staff, you know, I've trained everyone on how to run their own reports because I just think it's so impactful when you're doing the work, you can understand your own numbers, know how to analyze your own numbers, like what's working well, what's not working well, let's tell the story with our numbers. Um, and then um, making sure that, of, of course, managing sort of the spend down expectations and how are we serving the number of households we set out to serve? Um, and if we're not, like, where can we make a, a where can we make a change? Awesome, Jackie, you wanna talk successes? Yeah. Um, uh, so I'm, a, I'm also like a big data person and I like to see that, you know, you're hitting these like benchmarks because I, I think it's important for, and I know that um, Cindy just talked about, you know, it's important for the staff to see this kind of stuff that they're making an impact um, on the youth that they are, that they're working with, that they're serving. Um, you know, it's great to like, you know, exceed your numbers, but it's also great to see that those numbers are exceeding their own expectations, that the youth are able to do this on their own. Awesome. And Lee, how about you? You have a different lens because you get to support and guide communities. What type of successes are you seeing um, through the years with communities that you've helped to implement joint THRRH? Yeah, so the community that I, you know, that I that I work most closely with, and we, you know, facilitate their uh, renewal scoring process. It actually includes Jackie's project, and um, uh, and for those pro, we we don't have a lot of joint component projects at this point. Um, I think we were one of those communities that are those COCs that. Uh, we were hesitant to sort of jump in. And now that we have sort of become more um, sold, I guess, on the model, um, you know, it still has to, it, now we're like, we, we see it, we understand how to use it. We understand what this looks like as a tool in our system. And, but we're only going to use this tool when it makes sense, as I sort of stated before. So I think our way of, um, 
evaluating success will likely change over time. Um, but right now, for the most part, our joint component projects are evaluated uh, basically like our, trans our rapid rehousing projects, um, almost identical um, in terms of uh, the outcomes expected. Um, Again, I think that may change as we have more projects that are joint component over time, but that's really where things are. The other thing I'll mention, um, and I, I think we will learn a lot about how to effectively evaluate these projects uh, in a different way, is um, in our uh, Western Pennsylvania COC, uh, which is a YHDP, uh, YHDP community, uh, we're working on developing a continuous quality improvement process where um, uh, we're getting uh, the participation of folks who are in the projects. Um, and I think getting input from participants, which is very similar to what um, uh, Nicole and Cindy stated, uh, will also really help us to figure out different ways to evaluate these projects in ways that are, they're not just hitting the performance measures because they are, but how are they really being transformative for the for the folks that they're serving? All right, um, we have about 15 minutes left and I am just gonna ask each of our panelists to share one word like to any communities out there that already have a, a joint TH um, RRH component um, or maybe thinking about it, like why is it important? Maybe two words, because I don't know if you can describe why it's important in one word. Jackie, you want to go first? I'll say strategic fit. Strategic fit. Ooh, I like that. Okay, Jackie, you're up. Thank you, Lee. Oh, you put me on the spot. Um Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um. I don't know. Come back. Come back. I'm gonna think about this one. Okay. All right, Cindy. You're at, oh, Nicole. Nicole. I saw you come off speaker. Come off mute. I mean. Yeah. So if we had two words, I would say in homelessness. All right. I love it. Cindy. All right, y'all. I had two thoughts about this, and one is sort of like systematic, and one is sort of my program spirit talking, and I think. My two words are, you know, leverage. It's leverage. It is leverage is another way to meet people where they are, especially for us with families, um, pregnant parenting and help people access housing. And I, I just can't get enough of this like idea of, of like, oh, I can talk to this program. I can talk to that program. And I just think it's leverage. It's amazing. Um, my program answer is that it's a crucible. And I looked this up because I was trying to find my words today. And the Oxford Dictionary says that a crucible is when you take a severe trial and you add different elements and they interact, and then it leads to the creation of something new. And that is sort of the journey our families are in. They're under this severe trial of homelessness, and we get to kind of help add those ingredients of the things that are interacting. Low barrier, longevity, short-term, medium-term, you know, self-sufficiency models, whatever we're putting in there, but it's all part of the interaction and we are creating something new. And for the family, it's ending their homelessness. The new thing is housing potentially or long game housing. And I just think that it's a crucible and it's hard. It's the intensity, the heat, it's up, but it will create something new. So that's my program word. All the chat is buzzing. Jackie, I'm gonna turn it over to you. What I'm going to go with youth. If you are a youth serving community, do this for them because oh. it makes it, it makes a huge difference. Years of running this program, like I've seen it work. I know that youth need this. If you're limited on youth shelters in your area or options for youth, apply for this program. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much to each of you. All right, so that's gonna conclude our panel portion of today's discussion. I'd actually like to uh, have Katie Elder from Urban Institute rejoin us. Um, and Kay, if you can put that slide up uh, on behalf of Katie, I would love that. We've got some exciting um, news from the Urban Institute. Thank you, just waiting on 
make sure I have all the information up. But I can go ahead and just get started maybe with a quick introduction. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my name is Katie Elder, um, as Mary Francis mentioned at the top, and I'm a research associate at the Urban Institute in Washington, DC. Um, so specific to today's asks, I'm actually part of a small team of researchers um, that is conducting a mixed method study on joint component programs with funding from the Alliance. Um, so this is a 24 month project and it uses a community engaged approach to address three key questions around design and implementation of THRRH programs. Um, so those include what are the key design, implementation and service provision characteristics of these programs? Um, how do THRRH programs, how have they been developed and implemented in communities? And then also how do providers and program users view these programs? Um, so we're hoping that ultimately these findings will have some bearing on policy and best practices in THRRH programs, um, as well as helping to inform funding priorities. Um, and we're also hoping to provide at least some emerging evidence around program characteristics and implementation experiences um, with the goal of better supporting the needs of people experiencing uncensored homelessness. Um, so as part of that study, we recently launched a survey of THR, two THRRH providers to better understand their programs and services. Um, so you very likely may have received one or even a few emails from our team uh, inviting program staff and providers to take the survey um, so that we can get your perspective on your community's joint component program. Um, so we're really grateful to the Alliance to give us the opportunity to make an additional plug for the survey today. Um, and my colleague, Lyndon Bond, is actually on the call as well as a general participant and we will be dropping the link to the survey here in the chat. Um, you're also welcome to share your email in the chat and we can follow up with you directly offline um, just to share more information about the study and the survey link as well. Um, also happy to field any quick questions in the chat if that's helpful. Um, yes, uh, just another big thanks to the Alliance and to you all for participating if you have not already. Thank you so much, Katie. I just want to say one quick thing before I turn it over to Kay, who's going to wind us down. We got a lot of Q&A about where's the data, where's the evidence, where's the research. If y'all received those, uh, you know, invitation to complete the survey, please, 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 please complete the survey um, at the Alliance and also at Urban Institute. Like we firmly uh, ground our solutions and research and evidence, and we can't do that without y'all's input. So if y'all got it, check your spam, complete it, take the time, um, because what you have to say matters to us. With that, Kay, I'm going to kick it back over to you. Thank you so much, Mary Francis. So if you're checking um, in chat, um, Linda just got the link up in chat, and so it's there, but also just to let you know, Katie, is that folks are plugging in their email addresses in chat as well, um, so that we'll make sure to share those with you. So um, you want to just go to the last slide, Mary Frances. So thank you. And, and can we all like just like say thank you, Mary Frances, for just wielding this whole thing and managing it so well. Um, you all, questions were coming in furiously uh, through Q&A, and not only was Mary Frances actually typing along with some of the rest of us some answers, but pulling them over and, and getting our panelists to ask. And then when my share screen would not work, within a second, there she was getting hers up. So thank you for all of that. Um, but we wanted to let you know, uh, here are all your speakers, right? And so... Um, you're going to have this. And so please feel free to, to reach out to these folks. Um, Josh uh, Johnson, who was, um, has, you often see him on most of these uh, webinars that we've done, but um, between the two of us, we reached out to a lot of communities and we're just so impressed when we talked to these communities with the work that they were doing and how thoughtful it was. It, 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 and, and, and I wanna just let you all know that and really thinking about this is that these were communities that didn't just sort of like, oh, more money, let's just do something with it, but were very thoughtful about what do we need in this community and how is this component going to make a difference? Um, and for that, um, thank you so much for doing that. So again, and I think click it again one more time, Mary Frances, because I think that the rest of the information will come up in this last slide. There's one more click you can do. 
There you go. So if you have any questions at all on the series, please feel free to reach out to Josh Johnson at NEH.org. Um, been recorded. We will be getting the recording and the slides um, posted to everyone um, who has um, participated. And there will also be that link um, that will, and I think, I don't know, uh, Rachel, if, if you got that link in our chat, to the takeaways. The, so we do have a document that's a key takeaway. So if you're like, what are the most important things to remember? We've created a document for that. Also feel free to go back and look at all the recordings that are already there on our, our series. And here's that website. So it is Thursday afternoon. Um, one of my former colleagues in some training I did call this, called this Friday Eve. So happy Friday Eve to all of you. And we're giving you a few minutes back of your time as we end this. So thank you so much for joining. And again, thank you from the Alliance and all the rest of us. Thank you so much um, for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks for having me. People are still clicking off. Okay, can you, can you, can you stop ahead. the oh, okay.